Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Adelaide had always deemed herself to be a cut above, not quite like the others. To those looking in, it certainly seemed so. First off, Adelaide achieved top marks at school, smashing her A-levels. Then she breezed into a spot at the medical university. After half a dozen years of hard graft, she bagged her medical degree. And then, she picked quite the illustrious path training as a surgeon under the tutelage of some proper legends at the hospital. In certain parts of the world, being a female surgeon was seen as a bit off. This idea was hammered into lasses right from their freshest year. A favorite saying amongst the lecturers was, a woman surgeon is like a sea pig, neither fish nor fowl. But the majority of the young women weren't phased, they mostly let it slide. None of the girls, at least not in Adelaide's group, fancied themselves in the operating theater. At most, they had their eyes on cosmetic surgery, mastering the basics, lip fillers, removing odd lumps and bumps, and a bit of radiofrequency liposuction. They were after the pound signs, leaving the trickier operations to others. But Adelaide wasn't swayed by such talk. She had her sights set and went for it, full tilt. The word on the street was, without a bit of help or a bit of dosh, a woman wouldn't find herself a post at a proper hospital. Yet, Adelaide pulled it off, all on her own. Whether she'd confess or not, she did reckon there was something special about her. Even her colleagues saw this special something in Adelaide. They'd even go as far as calling her Dr. Adelaide Turner, even though she was fresh out the gate. But every dog has its day, and Adelaide's came around soon enough. Out of the blue, she was moved from surgery to a simple consulting room. The most she'd do was deal with a bug stuck in someone's ear, remove ticks, slap on a plaster cast, or drain a minor boil. Adelaide was befuddled, thinking maybe it was just a mix-up and she'd be back in her scrubs in no time. But no luck. She began knocking on the doors of the hospital higher-ups, seeking a straight answer. She even went as far as the Department of Health with her queries. Eventually, someone let slip that she wasn't really all that special. She'd just not ruffled any feathers until recently. But a few months back, for some reason, she turned away a rather influential patient who fancied jumping the surgery queue. Those waiting were in more dire straits than he was. So, Adelaide said no. She remembered it clear as day. At the time, she didn't think it was a big deal. However, this bloke had some serious pull. At the very least, he had enough clout to put Adelaide on the back burner for the foreseeable. That was the real story of her so-called uniqueness. Things spiraled from there. But this was more down to Adelaide herself than cruel fate. She went to the wall to stand up for what's right. She got a meeting with the local prosecutor, who, to give him his due, was all ears and vowed to look into it. Look into it, he did but in his own way. From the operating room, Adelaide found herself pushing a mop and bucket. It was all who you know, greasing palms, and everywhere people spouting their own brand of wisdom. Amongst them, that same seat pig analogy. Indeed, even such a twist failed to ignite any resentment in Adelaide, save for the fact that it marked a genuine calamity in her life. After all, who harbors ill feelings towards a hurricane or a volcanic eruption? People flee from them, take cover from them, salvage what they can from them. Thus, Adelaida simply took refuge and bided her time for the opportune moment to emerge from her sanctuary and assess the situation. Whilst en route to her night shift, she popped into a small shop not far from the hospital. Few folk ventured here in the evenings, mostly, visitors would come during the day to purchase something scrumptious for their relatives and friends in the hospital wards. Today, the scene was quite the same, save for a homeless chap warming himself by the heater in the lobby and two blokes rummaging about the shelves, attempting to find something. Adelaide procured a baguette for sausages and three sachets of coffee with cream, her usual provisions for the night shift. She had already paid the cashier and was opening the door to the lobby when the two lads came up to her, still without a purchase from the shelves. Listen here, one of them gruffly spoke, tall with dark stubble on his angular face. Toss us a couple of coins, we're just a tad short, you see. What? 
Adelaida was quite lost in thought, and the lad's manner, coupled with the utterly out-of-place request, was truly bewildering. Are you deaf or something? The other lad chimed in, withdrawing his hands from his pockets, his tattoos weaving an intricate pattern. Hand over the money. Better give us a good lot. Yeah, plenty. The tall one joined in with a sly grin, echoing his mate. Have both of you gone completely mad? Adelaida frowned, continuing to open the door. What more money do you want? Just go sleep it off, will you? The tattooed one pushed the door with vigor, wedging his boot into it, preventing it from fully opening. Adelaida now sensed the real threat, glanced about, but the shopkeeper was hidden behind shelves of notebooks and cards. This modest shop had never been fitted with surveillance cameras. Her only recourse seemed to be to cry for assistance. She was about to holler for the cashier's attention when the tall chap forcefully pushed Adelaida into the vestibule and clanged the door shut. Why make a fuss, he said, smirking. We were merely asking for a little something. Are you so reluctant to part with a few hundred? Just hand over all your money. Let's see what you've got. And he extended his hand, expecting Adelaida to hand over her wallet. The second lad took a folding knife from his pocket. The blade gleamed under the light of the lone lamp. Oh, my word. Adelaida thought, deeply alarmed. What utter madness. Hard to fathom. She opened her bag, scrambled for her wallet, and was about to hand it to the ruffians when suddenly an unexpected voice intervened, the fourth party in this scene, who had seemed entirely unnoticed. It was the homeless man who had been quietly observing the proceedings for quite some time. Leave the young lady be, he said, his voice steady and composed. Adelaida and the lads turned to him. He was a man of short stature, slightly stooped, with broad shoulders and sturdy legs. He was adorned in a well-worn shirt, equally tattered trousers, rubber boots with galoshes, and a shabby fur hat that might have once resembled a rabbit or a hare. With the temperature outside at minus 15 degrees Celsius, the man sought warmth near the long radiator. Who's this voice coming from the rubbish? Then, the tall one sneered. Seeking a bit of adventure, are you? Or is your hangover plaguing you so that you've lost your senses? Don't worry, mate, we'll share with you. We'll share some hawthorn berries with you. The homeless man uttered not a word. He took a few strides towards the lad who had spoken to him and with a barely noticeable, almost nonchalant motion, struck him in the jaw with his fist. The tall one crumpled onto the tiled floor as if his legs had betrayed him. His mate, witnessing this, recoiled slightly and twice stabbed the man in the abdomen with his knife. The man grimaced in pain but pressed on, he continued to advance. The lad danced before him for a couple of ticks, feigning to be a seasoned pugilist, but then abruptly altered his plans, made a dash for the exit, and bolted out onto the street, quickly vanishing from sight. It all happened so quickly that Adelaida scarcely had a moment to take it all in. For a moment, she stood there, purse clutched in her hand, until the tall bloke on the floor began to move, glancing about the lobby in evident confusion. It was only then that the tension within Adelaida unfurled unexpectedly, catching even herself off guard. With great force, she booted the man who was attempting to get up in the gut, preparing for another kick, but the tall fellow was now alert and sidestepped her. He quickly got up and scarpered after his mate. Meanwhile, the homeless chap slid down against the wall, clutching his belly. A crimson patch quickly darkened his shirt. Adelaida finally came back to her senses. You're in dire need of a doc, she said, bending over him. The hospital's just round the corner. I happen to work there, cleaning up after folks. Think you can make it? I've got you. The man looked up at her. His eyes weren't filled with pain, but an overwhelming sadness and sympathy. Blimey, he murmured, attempting to rise. Popped by there the other day, but didn't have any papers with me. No ID, nothing. They told me not to come around anymore. Don't you fret, Adelaida comforted. It's just the night crew in now. They won't give you any bother. And cheers for stepping in for me. You shouldn't have, truth be told, but now I've got to look after you. So, don't fight me on this. 
Helping him to his feet, the man managed a weak grin. No need for gratitude, he replied. Might be this was my ticket to getting a proper bed for the night. Oh, give over. Still got your humor, I see, she chuckled. Bit of a miscalculation on your part, though. Let's move along quietly, shall we? The hospital was but a stone's throw away. Adelaide's main worry was that those louts might come back and lay in wait for them. Fortunately, they arrived at a &E without any further ado. Inside, Conrado, who was on shift that evening, dashed over to help. They got the man into a gown and sat him on a bed. Adelaide took a gander at his injuries. They weren't too deep, thanks to his battered old jacket which had deflected the blade. One of the cuts merely grazed the surface. It wasn't bleeding much because it was only superficial. After a quick ultrasound confirmed no internal damage, Adelaida gave him something for the pain, cleaned up the cuts, stitched up the worst ones, and put a drain in for the deeper injury. And that's that, she declared, letting out a sigh. You'll pull through. Between all this madness, we never did swap names. I'm Adelaida. And you? Thank you, love, he replied. I can see you're not just any cleaner. You've got me stumped. Long story short, I've had a bit of surgical training. So, what's your name then? Some big secret? Name's Antonio. Antonio Vega, if you need it for the records. They going to kick me out again tomorrow? Well, I reckon the police will have to get involved tomorrow. You were mugged after all. No coppers, please. Don't put yourself out. Nothing dodgy about me. Just a regular bloke without a home. Don't fancy any questioning. They'll drag you into it too. But those ruffians have to answer for this, or they might do someone else over. I'll take care of them when I'm better. You don't need to worry about that either. Well, you say you're just an ordinary homeless man. So not that ordinary, if you're confident you can deal with those idiots. Who are you really, Antonio Vega? Adelaida gave him a playful look. And you're an ordinary hospital cleaner with surgical experience, the man replied. And I'm an ordinary homeless man with experience in dishing out blows. Simple as that. I see, Adelaida helped him put on a hospital gown. All right, let's just say if anyone asks, you got stuck on the fence while attempting a climb. You know, those spiked fences. I've always thought they were dangerous things. I'll speak with the director if he inquires. Let's go to the ward. Very well, let's go. The next morning, Adelaida didn't head home but stayed on for an extra shift. She was very sleepy due to the eventful night. At 2 o'clock, another guy arrived with bruises and a concussion. There was only one vacant bed left in the wards, and the hospital director, Constantino Grandes, would undoubtedly have questions about Antonio. Adelaida needed to defend him and managed to do so without involving the police. She somehow trusted the unknown man right from the start. She believed he would deal with those guys himself and that there was no need to call the police. At 6 in the morning, she changed his bandages, administered a couple of injections, and then went to a shop to buy something for breakfast. When she returned, the director was already storming about, and his voice could be heard down the corridor, right at the exit. Conrado rushed into the staff room, having changed and finished his shift, and warned Adelaida that Grandes was looking for her and was in a terrible mood. But Adelaida had mentally prepared for this and entered his office ready to stand up for herself and for Antonio, or so she believed. Ah, it's you, Adelaida, Constantino Grandes began in a raised voice, seems like life hasn't taught you anything. Are you here about Antonio? The girl asked calmly. What Antonio are you talking about? The patient brought in during the night, she explained. I mean the homeless man you didn't bring in on an ambulance, but rather picked up somewhere in an alley. What kind of stunt is that? And I see, your hands are still itching for your old job. You're still on probation, mind you. You might not even get your old position back. Fine, you brought in some unknown person, and now you're even stitching him up. And why didn't you call Sanchez? 
He's our surgeon, not you. Dr. Sanchez. You know him yourself, Adelaide retorted with the same calmness. He's hardly ever sober during his shifts, and the wound isn't that complex to bother him with it. What if he's some kind of fugitive or a convict on the run? No ID, no records. Who is he, anyway? His name is Antonio Vega. And I didn't find him in an alley, he actually came to us. I met him near the emergency department. He could call himself the Pope for all I care. What if he's an escapee or a murderer? You'll be an accessory, you understand? Why didn't you call the police? Constantino Grandes, why involve the police? Even if he's homeless. Aren't there plenty of cases of hypothermia that we receive in winter? We don't call the police every time. Hypothermia, sure, but now it's knife wounds we're dealing with, the director persisted. In short, why should I keep getting on your case? You've got two more weeks on your probation, and then goodbye. How come? Adelaida didn't expect such an outcome from the hospital director. Calm down, you're dismissed. What did you expect? That we'd bring every homeless person in the city here? I could even fine you for exceeding your authority. So stop causing problems, I know what you're like. Consider yourself lucky I'm just firing you. I won't write about you being a terrible intern. Find a job in another hospital. Or better yet, forget about medicine altogether. And what about Antonio? Which Antonio? Constantino Grandes still didn't understand. Oh, that one. Don't worry, the police took him to the station for identification. How is that possible? Adelaida began to lose control of herself. He has wounds, he needs bandages and medication. They'll take care of him there. You yourself said the wounds were minor. He'll survive. Did you see that guy they brought in with a concussion? He still hasn't fully regained consciousness. And what if he's your Antonio, whatever his name is? What if he did it to him, huh? Two people in one night. Coincidence? Nonsense, Adelaida said under her breath. How is that possible? Adelaida began to lose control of herself. He has wounds, he needs bandages and medication. They'll take care of him there. You yourself said the wounds were minor. He'll survive. Did you see that guy they brought in with a concussion? He still hasn't fully regained consciousness. And what if he's your Antonio, whatever his name is? What if he did it to him, huh? Two people in one night. Coincidence? Nonsense, Adelaida said under her breath. Exactly, the director nodded. A hospital cleaner sewing up wounds and inserting drains instead of changing diapers. Utter nonsense. That's it, you're free to go. I have a meeting now. Adelaida, somewhat shaken, left the office. She didn't expect this from the hospital director. Well, I didn't expect this from the hospital director. Whither could Antonio have been spirited away from the hospital? Following the course of events as she had envisioned, they should have transported him to the nearest department. Thus did Adelaida decide to begin. She boarded a bus and reached the third department, where she asked the duty officer if she could speak with Sergeant Lego. Hoping her logic hadn't failed her. Luck was with her, indeed, such a sergeant worked here, and what's more, he was currently on duty. Within five minutes, he emerged to meet her. A young fellow, recently discharged from the army, it seemed. Greetings, Adelaida greeted him. Hello. What do you want? The sergeant scrutinized the girl attentively. I'm from the city hospital. Adelaida Castro. This morning, you were at our place, and you took away a certain Antonio Vega from the ward for identification. Yes, that's right. And what do you want to know? I wanted to inquire about his subsequent fate. He's wounded. Is he all right? Just a moment, the sergeant said and disappeared behind a partition to the duty officer. There, he picked up the phone and dialed someone. Zacharias, he said into the phone, hello, it's Lego bothering you. This morning, they brought a homeless guy to you, 
Do you know what happened to him? What do you mean? Is he with you now? They're asking about him. I see. Around noon? And where to? How so? All right, all right, no need for profanity. Okay, got it. Goodbye. Adelaida looked at him questioningly. The sergeant shrugged and said, He was taken away somewhere during lunch. And where? Unknown. How is that even possible? And what exactly is your concern? I'm his attending doctor, Adelaida lied, concerned about the patient's health. Sorry, I can't help. These things happen. Do you know how many clients we deal with in a whole day, brought in and taken out? You can't keep track of everyone. Don't worry, I'm sure they'll take care of him if something happens. Adelaida lowered her gaze. But something did happen to him, she thought, and you've already taken care of it. Further questions seemed pointless, and expressing her displeasure to this sergeant seemed unnecessary. He probably had Antonio in his sight for about 10 minutes while transporting him to the department. All right, Adelaida said, I understand. Where, in principle, could they have taken him? No idea. Maybe to court. Or to the hospital for examination. Or perhaps they released him due to lack of evidence. It's hard to guess. They could have taken him many places. I see, Adelaida concluded, goodbye. With a concerned look, she stepped out onto the street, not knowing where else to turn for information. Exhaustion hit her even harder, her head throbbed with pain. No, she urgently needed to sleep and gather her thoughts, otherwise, she would be of no use in this condition. And Adelaida slept that day until the next morning. Upon arriving at work, she endured eight hours, listening to colleagues' condolences about her fate. She had two more weeks left until her dismissal. Those were the conditions. The job had become unbearable. Adelaida arranged with Conrado for him to cover most of her remaining shifts, and he agreed. Especially since he owed her four shifts. Conrado was the only one in the hospital with whom she had managed to build a friendly relationship. He didn't keep his distance from Adelaida like others did, as if fearing that the misfortune of a former surgeon might somehow rub off on them. Listen, Adelaida decided to ask Conrado when they sat down to have lunch together, how can you find a person who has no address, no car, no insurance, nothing at all? Is there any institution you can turn to? Are you talking about the patient from the day before yesterday? For example, you take in a person and then their trail goes cold. Conrado pondered for a minute, taking a big sip of black coffee. I think, he said, only through the police, no other way. But I went to the police station, it was useless. You shouldn't go to a station, you should go to the National Institute of Migration. If they don't know, then it's unlikely anyone else does. But I only know the name and surname, nothing else. Then they'll give you a whole list of people with the same surname, it will be easier to search from there. But I don't understand why you need this. Anyway, not my business, I get it. The subject's closed, sorry. Well, I don't rightly know why, but I sense I ought to help this individual. Addy, you're something else. The ground's aflame under your feet, yet here you are thinking about a complete stranger, a homeless chap no less. You should be looking for a job, and preferably as far from here as possible, because Grandez will do everything in his power to ruin your life, especially if you try to find work in the medical field. I understand that, Adelaida agreed. Thanks for the lead, Conrado. As for work, I'll figure it out, don't you worry. Adelaida genuinely understood all the scenarios that would now shape her immediate future. The city hospital was considered the best in town, and even in the region, with a sterling reputation. So many sought treatment here rather than at their local hospitals. While the hospital director, Constantino Grandes, had a detestable personality and treated his staff with little reverence, he held significant influence in the regional medical circles. He wielded a certain power, and it was believed that he owed this not so much to his inherent sternness as to his connections at the highest levels of the Ministry of Health. Other hospitals in town knew him well, some even emulated his ways, vile as they were. 
Therefore, Adelaida could hardly hope to secure a position at any hospital in the region. Grandes' reach would extend to her, transforming her life into a struggle for survival. Now there were only two options. Either she could seek work in unrelated fields, ones not tied to medicine, or she could sell her apartment and escape as far as possible from these parts. Adelaida possessed no skills other than medical ones. Sure, she could work as a janitor or attempt to learn to operate a knitting machine, but in her mind, that would be a complete fall from the heights of exceptionality into the abyss of mediocrity. Over time, her surgical skills might wither away completely, she felt that deeply. She held on to just one hope, that this black streak would end, and she'd wield a scalpel once more. However, over these two weeks she was working before her dismissal, the streak merged with the horizon, leaving no hope for a bright future. So, option number two remained, she needed to fight for herself to the bitter end. Not against someone, but for something. To hell with Constantino Grandis. Among the eight billion people populating the planet, one couldn't fail to find a worthy place for oneself. Philosophizing carried Adelaida further away from reality, while reality drew nearer and nearer to her. However, for now, she needed to locate Antonio. She could sort out the job later. Adelaida couldn't explain to herself this pressing desire to know that this man was fine, as fine as a man without a fixed abode could be. At the very least, for her peace of mind, it would suffice to know he was alive and relatively healthy. No one could help her right now, but she could provide some assistance to Antonio. Perhaps it was this very circumstance that made Adelaida feel the need to search for the missing person. Nobody can, but she can. That's Adelaida Castro for you, still exceptional, no matter what. On Friday, she finally reached the immigration office as the response to her letter, which she'd sent a week ago, hadn't arrived. Insisting on speaking with the head of the department, she spent an hour in his office listening to information unrelated to Antonio. Among all he said, it became clear only that the local immigration service had no information about such an individual. And where should I turn then? Adelaida said, feeling lost. We can send your inquiry to the capital, the major replied. Try your luck there. It's better if you go in person since we've been having constant technical issues with the mail lately and letters take a long time. But don't you have a shared database of citizens? Why should I go to the capital? The major smiled. There's information, he said, that can only be accessed in the capital. I don't think your case involves someone whom everyone is entitled to know about. Still, give it a shot. Perhaps they'll tell you something more specific than I can find out. All right, Adelaida agreed with the Major. She couldn't really disagree and demand anything more. On Tuesday, Adelaida bought a ticket to the capital. The journey would take her six hours. It was dreadfully cold outside. The bus she was on broke down halfway, and the passengers waited nearly an hour until they were transferred to another bus. She barely made it to the immigration center by the end of their workday. The clock was already approaching five in the evening when she entered the office of the department head. He wasn't as talkative as his provincial colleague, perhaps because he was in a hurry to get home, or maybe he just didn't see the need for verbosity in this case. The conversation ended with him advising Adelaida to contact the general staff of the armed forces. Nothing more, nothing less. At first, Adelaida thought he was simply jesting with her, but the subcolonel's expression was stern. Are you serious? She couldn't help but express her surprise. Quite. From our end, there's nothing we can do, but there's some indirect evidence suggesting that the general staff might have knowledge about Antonio Vega. That's if, of course, he's the same Antonio Vega. Any other questions? None, Adelaida almost answered like a soldier and left the office. On Wednesday morning, she was heading for her final shift when she stopped by a familiar little shop, as was her routine, to buy lunch supplies. After paying, she stepped out onto the street and had taken a few steps when she heard a voice behind her. Excuse me, miss. She turned around and was taken aback. These were the ones she dreaded meeting the most. Standing before her were the very two men who had tried to rob her two weeks ago. However, their appearance now was entirely different. 
the lanky one had his right arm in a cast up to his elbow, and the face of his accomplice, who had danced around with a knife in front of Antonio, resembled a partly rotten pumpkin in places. What do you want? Adelaida took a step back and inquired. Wait, we, the lanky one stammered slightly. We'd like to apologize for what happened at the shop. Adelaida couldn't believe her ears. And also, continued the man. Here, take this. He handed her a banknote. It's compensation for the moral, so to speak, damage. I don't need your money, Adelaida took another step back. Put that away. I have no use for your apologies. Do you even remember what you did to that man? He's the one you should be seeking forgiveness from, not me. I've long forgotten about you. We, the lanky one, started to mumble. We've already apologized to him. See? He raised his broken arm. Compensation's in order too. Are you suggesting he did this to you? Please, take it. The pumpkin-faced man joined the conversation. Don't refuse, or we're in trouble. So, where's Antonio? Is he all right? Can you tell me where I can find him? We can't. The lanky one shook his head. We're not allowed. We're only supposed to give you this. He extended the banknote again. Take it. Don't turn it down. But is he healthy and still in town? He's well. But where he is now, we don't know. We've been waiting for you for three days. Fine, Adelaida took the money. If you happen to meet him again. No, no. The second man waved his hands. God forbid. We're leaving the city right now, altogether. So, we won't be running into anyone. You'll have to figure that out yourself. All right, farewell, we've got to go. Well then, Adelaida said, watching the two men quickly walk away. What a turn of events, she said aloud to herself, turned around, and with a smile, headed towards the hospital. The train ticket to the capital turned out to be not so cheap, so the money received from the criminals, though unpleasant, proved to be well-timed. This time she decided to travel by train. The carriage was bustling with cheerful commotion and confusion. It had been a while since Adelaida had taken a train anywhere, and she had grown unaccustomed to such a tumultuous environment, yet it didn't bother her in the slightest. She surprised herself with this fact. On the contrary, she relished the fact that life around her was teeming, children ran around the carriage, adults chatted about trivialities with one another. How she had missed this. Her mother had passed away while she was still studying medicine, and she had never known her father. He left the family when she was barely four years old, so there was no one left to travel to for a long time. Adelaida, a person meticulous in details, demanding of herself and others, appeared cold to those around her, excessively prudent, and nearly unapproachable. She was a perfectionist in every sense of the word, which guaranteed her success as a surgeon but brought forth numerous problems as a woman. This was compounded by the fact that Adelaida, who possessed an outward appearance that was undeniably attractive and even beautiful, was rarely able to find friends, let alone those who would be willing to share not just dinner but also a bed with her. Her slim legs, the first thing men noticed, her pleasant round face with gray eyes and a slightly upturned, neat nose, full lips not usually associated with those of strong character, everything about her was just as it should be. But the men seemed to fear her. Only twice had Adelaide have come close to forming any significant connection. The first time was in college, and the second was in the hospital, but both of these relationships ended before they could mature into discussions of marriage. In college, her first boyfriend transferred to a military medical academy and invited her to another city, to which she naturally declined. And the romance with Camarado in the hospital was even shorter, lasting only a week. It ended on its own somehow, without any specific reasons. A passionate affair that made both of them forget everything in the world, as if it had burned out like a spark in a fire. However, Adelaida and Conrado managed to remain friends. Over the course of several years, they never attempted to resurrect what had irreversibly died. No more men appeared in her life after that. Unpleasant changes began to occur in Adelaida's character. 
Her former meticulousness disappeared, details slipped from her attention. Things at home and at work ended up in places where they weren't supposed to be. Adelaida was afraid that if she were to return to the operating room, she wouldn't be able to perform her work as skillfully as she used to. She had changed. Perhaps adversity had bent Adelaida, causing her to transform, or maybe it was her own choice, not yet fully realized, but still hers. But now she was sitting on the train and smiling. She was surrounded by happy people, and their joy seemed to energize her. New Year's and Christmas were just around the corner. Schools had gone on vacation. Where were all these people headed? Most likely to their families or friends, maybe to a winter camp. The scent of mandarins wafted through the carriage, intensifying thoughts of Christmas. But where was she going? To the general staff headquarters of the armed forces. If she were to tell her fellow passengers, they would surely be surprised. And she had no one to celebrate Christmas with. She used to at least attend the hospital's corporate events, but now even that path was closed to her. Suddenly, these thoughts about the upcoming holiday stirred up such a wave of melancholy in Adelaida that her smile vanished, and she felt like crying right then and there. From her confusion, she was pulled out by the voice of a little girl who approached her closely and extended a mandarin in her direction. Miss, she said in a delicate voice. Take this, it's for you. Thank you. Adelaida accepted the gift and smiled again. Don't be sad, the girl added. Everything will be fine. And she ran off. No. No, Adelaida thought, I'm doing everything right. Somewhere deep, deep down, she sensed that new feeling that had prompted her to board the train. Not just gratitude to Antonio for standing up for her, but a growing desire to see him again. Adelaida had so many questions for this man. Firstly, how had he fallen so far, to the point where he had to warm up by store heaters? She herself had once plummeted into a pit, who knows what would await her in five years' time. She might sell her apartment, move away, and things could easily go off script. She might lose her money and become a wanderer without a fixed address, losing her surgical skills and struggling to learn something new. Secondly, who was this Antonio before he ended up on the streets? He had instilled such fear in those two thugs that it was hard to believe it was possible at all. If he could single-handedly do something like that, what kind of Terminator was he? And if he had connections in some authoritative or criminal circles, why was he wearing an old, dirty jacket and unable to even secure a bed in a hospital? Many questions and a strong desire to help him. Maybe even invite him to spend Christmas with her. Why not? If Adelaida wanted to share a Christmas dinner with anyone, it would be him. In the morning, the train arrived in the capital. Garlands were hung everywhere, and Christmas trees were set up. Shop windows were adorned with Santas and snowmen. Adelaida reached the general staff headquarters rather quickly and arrived just as her work shift was beginning. At the entrance, she was asked for her documents and the purpose of her visit. They issued her a pass, and within five minutes, she was already in the waiting room of the relevant official. Soon, he appeared as well. A tall, dignified man with the rank of a colonel. Adelaida noted to herself that each new visit to these administrative offices added one more star to the epaulets of their occupants. She wryly calculated that the success of her plan was getting closer to a fortunate conclusion. All that was left was to reach the general. Diego Pena, the secretary, addressed the colonel. This young lady is here to see you. What matter brings you? The man turned to Adelaida. I'm here about Antonio Vega, if that means anything to you. Yes, yes, the colonel nodded, Vega. I've been expecting you for a while. I was informed by the immigration service. Let's discuss it in my office. Please come in. Adelaida followed him into the office and closed the door behind her. Please have a seat, the man gestured to a chair. Would you like some coffee? No, thank you. Adelaida was surprised by the friendly tone of the official. People of his status usually interacted with her quite curtly. Very well, then let's get to the point. Yes. You're searching for Antonio Vega, correct? Yes. 
Can you tell me where and under what circumstances you met him? Can you describe it? The colonel's question was rather peculiar, but this time, Adelaida didn't withhold anything. She told him everything, about meeting him in the store's vestibule, about Antonio being kicked out of the hospital. And as for a description, she concluded, he's a very good person, a righteous one. His appearance doesn't match that of a homeless person. He looks strong, sturdy. You can understand that knocking a man like that off his feet with one blow is not something just anyone can do. After all, those guys later found me, and as compensation, as they put it, they gave me a substantial sum. One of them had a broken arm, and the other had a bruised face. The colonel unexpectedly chuckled. I recognize him, he said through laughter, I recognize Antonio. So, that's where he was hiding all this time. Is he still in your town? You know him? Adelaida exclaimed once again, not answering the man's question. Just a moment, the colonel opened the drawer of the desk and took out a thick album, the kind usually used for photographs. I brought this from home just in case, in case you were looking for that same Antonio. Take a look, do you recognize anyone? Adelaida took the album in her hands and scrutinized the photograph the colonel pointed to. Here. She pointed with her finger, it's Antonio, only young. The colonel looked at the photo. Are you sure? He asked. Absolutely. And this is you, Adelaida pointed at the guy with his arm around Antonio's shoulder. Exactly, confirmed the colonel. I'm a bit older than Antonio and hold a higher rank. But we started together, and he's like a brother to me. Saved my life more than once. Allow me. And the man returned the album to the drawer. So, it is indeed him, and you can't imagine how glad I am about it. But you still haven't answered my question. Is he still in town? I don't know, Adelaida shrugged. Those guys who gave me the money didn't say much. Maybe he's still in town. So, you have no information either, Adelaida Castro? The man said with a smile. You now possess the very last and most accurate information I've managed to dig up over a long time. I've been searching for Antonio for five years now since. Well, perhaps that's not worth mentioning. You're truly remarkable. I can't even fathom how to thank you for your act. What act? Adelaida objected. I'm just searching for a person. Exactly, dear, search, while you could have easily forgotten the very next day after he was taken from the hospital. He means nothing to you, you might think, he stood up for you. You've already done everything you could for him, even got fired from your job because of it. There are so many indifferent people around now. And you're the exception. Stop it, Adelaida didn't like that word. Tell me instead, will you help me find him? Do you have that capability? Of course. Of course. Here, take this. The colonel handed Adelaida a business card. If you happen to come across Antonio in the town, be sure to call me. And I, in turn, will definitely get in touch with you if I discover any leads. Just leave me your phone number. All right, Adelaida agreed. And she jotted down her number on a piece of paper, and what should I say about you if I happen to meet Antonio? Tell him a friend is looking for him. Cartucho. What? He'll understand. Cartucho was my call sign. Do you know what call sign he had? No. God. Goodness. You have no idea what he did for us. Saved so many lives, but unfortunately, I can't tell you about that either. In short, I'll deploy all resources to find him, you can be certain of that. I'm glad to hear that. Right now, I suppose I'll get started, concluded the colonel and softly clapped his hands on the table. Diego Pena, a voice from the intercom sounded, the secretary's voice. Meeting in five minutes. Understood, understood, he replied, on my way. Well then, he turned to Adelaida, I shall take my leave from you at this point, time for business. And, I hope, we will meet again. Goodbye, Adelaida bid farewell to the colonel and left the office. Time went by. 
The last week before Christmas flew by so quickly that Adelaida was even surprised, looking at the calendar in the morning. Throughout this time, she awaited news from the colonel, but nothing happened. The phone remained silent, Antonio also gave no sign of himself. She finally decided to put her apartment up for sale, but on this matter, no one hurried to call her, everyone was preparing for the holiday, potential buyers, banks, notary offices. Matters revolved entirely around one goal, to bid farewell to the old and tune into the better future that was bound to arrive. And as the festive evening drew closer, Adelaide's spirit became increasingly overcast. Could all her efforts be in vain? So much effort expended, so many nerves, so many unfulfilled hopes fell like yellowing leaves deep into her heart. Adelaide couldn't bear to be alone in the house any longer. Even the walls seemed to close in on her here, and everything slipped from her hands. She stepped out onto the street without a specific purpose. She simply walked and walked, turning into the first alleys that came her way. The evening was deepening. Snow was falling in large flakes, twirling slowly in spirals under the lampposts. Cars were bustling near supermarkets like sharks hunting for unsuspecting prey. People hurried to buy food for their tables or gifts in case they were suddenly invited somewhere. Adelaida scrutinized the faces of passers-by, hoping to see among them the one and only face that she would never forget. Could Christmas miracles actually come true? Suddenly, the phone rang. Adelaida saw an unfamiliar number, but decided to answer. It could be some buyer. Hello. Adelaida Castro? A male voice came from the other end. Yes, this is me. Could you come to the city hospital where you used to work right now? Why? And who are you? Diego Pena asked me to call you. There's some news regarding the matter that interests you. Adelaida's heart skipped a beat. Here it was, a Christmas miracle. Could it be that Antonio was found? But why isn't Diego calling himself, and why do you need to go to the hospital? Could something have happened to Antonio again? All right, Adelaida said, I'll be there in about 20 minutes. Go straight to the Grandes office. We'll be there. Okay. Invited me to the Grandes office, that's strange, Adelaida thought. Joy somehow retreated inside, the situation was too ambiguous. At the entrance to the hospital's reception area, Conrado was already waiting for the girl. He nervously smoked, standing in a thin coat. Hey, Addie, he said upon seeing her. Hey, and why are you without a jacket outside? Oh, it's nothing. He waved his hand. Listen, there's such a commotion going on, you won't believe it. What happened? Conrado chuckled. Grandis almost lost his mind. No one's ever seen him like this. He was talking to some incomprehensible people about you in his office. Military folks in uniform came to see him. Adelaida was silent for a couple of seconds and then asked, Are you on duty for Christmas? Yeah. What am I supposed to do alone at home? Merry Christmas, by the way. Same to you, Adelaida smiled, taking off her coat in the rest area. I'll go find out what they want from me. Go, good luck. Thanks, Adelaida nodded, took a deep breath, and briskly walked toward Grandes office. In the office, three people awaited her, two military men, one a major and the other a lieutenant colonel, and Constantino Grandes himself. The military men were standing, while the director sat on a chair, his face red, absent-mindedly gazing at his shoes. Please take a seat, Adelaida Castro. The major introduced himself and offered Adelaida a chair. Adelaida sat down silently, keeping her distance from Grandis. He was particularly disagreeable to her at the moment. First of all, the major began, we want to express our gratitude on behalf of Diego Pena. Unfortunately, he couldn't come in person. But you may still meet him. Thanks to you, a person of great importance to him has been found. Found? Adelaida exclaimed excitedly. How is he? Where is he? Is he all right? He's all right, don't worry. The lieutenant colonel joined in and glanced at his watch. Soon you'll be able to speak to him yourself. 
Adelaida wanted to say something more, but the officer stopped her with a gesture. That's for later. He continued, first, Constantino Grandes has something to tell you. Grandes gave a pitiful look to the lieutenant colonel, then lowered his gaze again and tightly pressed his lips together. The color on his face was already turning blotchy. He looked at Adelaida with a mixture of resentment and almost ground out through his teeth. Adele. Adelaida Castro, I want to ask for your forgiveness for treating you unjustly, and he fell silent. And cruelly, the lieutenant colonel added for him. And cruelly, Grandes repeated. Adelaida's thoughts were a jumble. Over the past while, this was already the third person asking for her forgiveness. While such behavior could somewhat be expected from bandits, hearing such words from Grandes was beyond imagination. Something was clearly amiss in this world. In short, the director concluded, completely deflated, I was wrong, and starting from tomorrow, I'm relinquishing my authority. I'm retiring. And you, Adelaida Castro, can resume your surgical practice. I've already signed all the documents. What? Adelaida almost whispered. I don't understand anything. What's happening here? Nothing special, Adelaida, the major began again. Everything is simply falling into place. Justice is prevailing. What do you have to say about this? We could have done everything officially, through courts and dozens of other instances, but we chose to expedite the process. Especially since today is such a holiday. Do you agree? I say, of course, but thoughts were gradually taking shape, indeed. I accept your apologies, Adelaida addressed Grandis. Thank you, Adelaida said softly, and please convey to Diego Pena that I am very grateful to him. Most assuredly, we will. And when can I see Antonio? The lieutenant colonel looked at his watch again. Perhaps, he said, right now, you can. Adelaida jumped up from her chair. Where? Proceed to the restroom, he might be waiting for you there. Thank you, the girl quickly said and rushed out of the office. As she opened the door to the restroom, her heart was racing. Upon entering, Adelaida froze for a second. A man around 35 years old was seated at the table in an elegant suit in which she didn't immediately recognize the once homeless man. Antonio? She whispered. Is it you? The man smiled and stood up from his chair. It's me. Hello, Adelaida Castro. Adelaida was about to rush into his embrace, but she held herself back, suspecting that maybe only she had grown so close to this person over the past period. He, perhaps, hadn't even thought about her in the last six months. Antonio seemed to read her thoughts, walked up to her, and gently hugged her. Tears welled up in Adelaida's eyes. I was so worried about you, she said, you have no idea. I searched for you everywhere, even made it to the capital. I know, Antonio said calmly, releasing the girl from the hug and sitting back down. Why didn't you show up to me earlier? Where were you? Where did they take you from the police station? It's a long story, Antonio waved his hand, a sad and uninteresting one. I didn't want to complicate your life. But then my good friend found me and explained how your life had been ruined because of helping me. He told me that you were fired. I couldn't hide anymore. I needed to restore justice. And who were you hiding from? How did you end up on the streets at all? This suit suits you so well, and the role of a homeless person is definitely not yours. I was hiding from myself. That's how life turned out. I had a lot to think about, a lot to put in place. Not the best way to contemplate life that you chose, Adelaida noted, and Diego Pena was searching for you for so long. With Cartucho. I mean, Diego Pena and I served together in the army. Yes, he told me something. About how his call sign was Cartucho, and yours was God. Yes, exactly. That's how it all started. One of the many hot spots in the East. Where I, so to speak, was fortunate enough to be. In the intelligence service, Diego and I served together. Back to back, as they say. He was my commanding officer. 
We saved many innocent lives then. We exposed many enemy plans. But while I served the motherland, my beloved took a lover. Our mutual acquaintances informed me. I couldn't bear it, asked for leave, came home to figure out what was going on. My wife didn't lie. She gave me an ultimatum, either I live with her, don't go anywhere anymore, or she and our daughter will leave to her, well, you understand. I tried to save our marriage. I couldn't imagine my daughter living with a stepfather. I left intelligence, I couldn't think about anything else. And it seemed like everything was getting better, I found a job. My daughter started to get used to me again, calling me dad. My wife looked at me with love again, just like before. But then I got into an accident. I was on a work trip, and a reckless driver crashed into me. He died, I survived. And then it began. This reckless driver turned out to be the son of the local prosecutor. He was at fault, not me. But they wanted to pin all the blame on me. They even covered up the fact that he was drunk behind the wheel. As if that never happened. They tormented me for nearly two years. But in the end, my lawyers managed to prove my innocence. My wife didn't wait for the trial. She couldn't handle all these problems. She left me for her boss and forbade me from seeing our daughter. I gave them the house. I didn't want any further confrontations. So, I was left without a job, without a wife, without a daughter, and without a home. And I got lost in life. I might seem strong in spirit, but I broke down, having lost my family. Couldn't your friends help you? I only had friends in the army. What about your parents? My grandmother raised me. My mother handed me over to her, and she hardly ever visited the village afterwards. When I was drafted into the army, my grandmother passed away. There was nowhere to return to as a civilian. Her house burned down, and the village became deserted quite quickly. After the army, I decided to enroll in a military academy. And then things went awry. You've been through a lot, Adelaida said with sympathy. Well, it's all fine now. But let's stop talking about me. Do you know what I want to propose to you? What? You're free tonight, aren't you? Certainly. How do you view spending this Christmas with me? Adelaide joyfully clapped her hands. I view it very positively, she said with a smile. I have a spot reserved at a restaurant. Live music, carnival atmosphere, and all that jazz. And, most importantly, a surprise for you. A surprise? Yes. Shall we go? I just need to get dressed. I can't go to restaurants in my home clothes. No problem. We'll head to your place. You can change. We'll make it in time. Then why are we sitting here? Onward? Onward. And they dashed out of the hospital, not noticing anyone in their path. Adelaida had already forgotten about the offer to return to surgery and about Grandis, who was probably drowning his sorrows in drink. She forgot about all the hardships that nearly broke her over this difficult month. It seemed to her that she and Antonio had always been together and everything else was just a dream. Outside, the snowfall intensified and everything around was covered in a white haze. They took a taxi tightly holding each other's hands, and it felt like unknown forces were now carrying them to a fairy tale land where they would find everything they had been searching for so long, and from which they would never return to this miserable city. They were together, and they were indeed exceptional. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.